welcome on stage, Merck. Absolute pleasure sitting next to you. Um, so, kind of got 35 minutes to, to get this kind of moving. So, I'm going to kind of go straight into it, really. Um, so, really start with kind of how Merck got into management and his, his journey, really. Sure. Um, so, hi, everyone. Thanks for, uh, for being here. Um, some of you may or may not know that, you know, I've had the great privilege uh, over the last 30 odd years of managing Elton John, Guns N' Roses, Beyonce, Morrissey, Iron Maiden, uh, you know, number one songwriters such as Diane Warren, The Dream, Justin Tranter. Um, and I use the word privilege because uh, managing artists, as far as I'm concerned, is a privilege. I'm not someone that can uh, play the guitar or sing the song. And even though I've been obsessed with music since about the time of six years old, I had the very loud voice of who I can only assume was God in my ear saying, that's never going to be you. You're never going to be Robert Plant. You're never going to be Jimmy Page. You know, you need to figure out a, a, a different path to take. Um, and having a seat at the table uh, with so many wonderful artists over the years, as I say, has, has, has been a privilege for me. And, and what gives me a seat at that table is that I advocate on their behalf, I protect their art, and effectively, you know, I try to maximize their commerce while ensuring that their art is compromised in the least way possible. Um, and the lesson that you know, sort of brought me into management is that I, I started my career when I was about 19 at Virgin Records. And uh, at that point in time, Virgin Records was still owned by Richard Branson. Um, Richard's cousin, Simon, who was Draper, who was the real sort of music brains in the company, uh, who had wonderful and eclectic taste. Um, it was the most artist-friendly record company in the world. And I went to work for this record company. And by the way, under Ted Cockle, I think that it probably is once again. Um, but you know, I went into this company believing that I worked for the artist. And uh, over the course of three or four years, we had this tremendous success with artists like Simple Minds, which was my favorite band on the label and the band that I really championed, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, UB40, The Blue Nile, Culture Club, who were having almost sort of you know, Beatlemania-like success. Um, and because of that success, they rewarded me a while later with allowing me to be part of signing an artist. And it wasn't until that took place and I saw what the trials and tribulations were of that artist making the record and trying to get everyone in the label to understand what it was that they were trying to do that I suddenly recognized that I wasn't actually working for the artist. I was working for Richard Branson. And even though there was a certain amount of alignment with the artist, ultimately, at the end of the day, Richard wanted to make money. And artists also want to make money, but the great ones, first and foremost, want to ensure that they are able to deliver to the world their vision of you know, what a great record would be, what a great stage show would be, et cetera. And that was the, the uh, kind of uh, catalyst for me to wake up and call these two guys, Rod and Andy, who were managing Iron Maiden already. And Iron Maiden was you know, sort of post Number of the Beast, already well on its way to success and, and, and being very well respected around the world. Um, and I called them up and I said, listen, I've had this epiphany. I'm not supposed to be working for a record company. I'm supposed to be a manager. And they were both 15 years older than I was. And as I say, they were having this sort of first real serious blush of success. And one of them was thinking about having, you know, getting married to his sweetheart and having babies. And the other one was thinking about going on the road with Iron Maiden for, you know, 200 nights a year and living the most debauched lifestyle possible. So they were very willing to sort of hand me some responsibility 
And, uh, you know, because they had something that I wanted and I had something that they wanted. And we created this company called Sanctuary. And over 20 odd years, we went from being Iron Maiden's management company to, you know, managing everyone from Elton to Beyonce and all artists in between. Okay, so that gives you a kind of uh, an understanding of where Merck's come from. And so who are you managing at the moment? So, you know, um, Nile Rogers is the marquee name that I manage. Um, and, you know, sort of all aspects of his career from the writing and the production straight through to, you know, what she could do on the road every night. But, um, you know, I've spent the, the last, um, the majority of the last 17 years in America um, and uh, two years, and I've promised my wife uh, every year that we would move back to London. Um, and uh, every year it sort of became, it'll be next year, it'll be next year, it'll be next year. Because what happened in Los Angeles was that, uh, you know, the songwriting community, you know, we, the, the, the era of music that I came into was... Uh, what I call the, the era of the artist, where 90% of the artists that we would sign were artists that wrote their own songs, um, had a really good idea of who they were, had a strong idea of who they might become, what their album cover should look like, what their stage show should look like, um, you know, what politics they should be involved with, what charities they should be, causes and charities they should be aligned with, et cetera. It was a ve very much an integrity-driven <laughs> Business and you know you look at, at someone like a Morrissey or an Iron Maiden or a Pet Shop Boys, all of whom I, I as I say I had the pleasure of managing, and on the surface they couldn't be more different from each other. But below the surface, their success is based on exactly the same thing, which is that they have integrity with people that are misfits and that really need music in their lives and that that are the kind of uber consumers, if, if you like, because, you know, I was the sort of kid that I couldn't study for a test at school without music. I couldn't get the courage up to ask a girl out without music. You know, the, the, the idea of, the of, of getting through life's anxieties was only possible because of music and artists that I believe in. Um, and when we sold Sanctuary to Universal in 2008, 2009, I could see the business was changing and that we were going from what I call that era of the artist to being the era of the song. And I was talking to um, someone a little bit earlier and, and, and saying, look, you know, 90% of the artists that are being signed today are talented kids that just want to be famous. And they don't care whether that fame comes from singing someone else's song or whether that fame comes via a talent competition like, you know, America's Got Talent or Britain's Got Talent or The X Factor or whatever have you. They don't even care if it comes from a sex tape. The fame is more important than, you know, the, 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 the song or the message, if you like. So the, the real star of the show today is the songwriter, because the songwriter is delivering the product that people want to hear. Now, it's not to say that the song hasn't always been of the utmost importance, but it's never been more important than it is right now. And the songwriter um, is, is, is obviously, should be the highest man or woman on the totem pole. <clears throat> and I, I, as I said, I started to recognize that this era was changing. So I ended up in, in, in Los Angeles. The songwriting community ended up in Los Angeles. And I went to work with people like The Dream and Diane Warren and, and Justin Tranter. And we had tremendous success. And then two years ago, my youngest child, who's just turned 16 the other day, got uh, sort of recruited by the Brit School with a view to going to school there and and uh my wife sort of gave me the you know kind of look that was sort of like look fucker you can no longer kind of put this off you know you now have to really think seriously about getting back to england um so at that point i made you know sort of some decisions on what i wanted to do 
with the rest of my life because I have no plans to you know, retire or anything like that. I mean, I, I get paid to listen to music. I get paid to talk to artists. I get paid to, <coughs> excuse me, help people make great records. So why would I ever want to retire? It's what I would be doing in my wet dreams <laughs> if, I, if I were retired. <laughs> Um, so, but what I was able to do was kind of really think seriously about what's next, and I, I decided to start two companies. One was a company, uh, and they're both called Hypnosis, but one's called Hypnosis Music and the other one's called Hypnosis Songs. Um, so the, the Hypnosis Music only develops new artists, and the point with it is that I use my own money to develop these artists to a place where I believe that they are ready to drop onto a record company's release schedule. So not where a record company would start to maybe believe that there was something there and would want to develop them further, but where they would hear it and go, okay, put that in for you know, October 21st or January 11th or whatever the date might be. Um, and we've developed those you know, four artists so far. One of them is with the aforementioned Ted Cockle at Virgin. One of them is with Craig Kalman at, uh, uh, at Atlantic in New York. One of them is with Rob Stringer at Columbia. Um, and then the fourth one, I think, is going to go to Warner's. Um, and uh, the idea is really, really simple, which is, is that I have tremendous belief in the artists that uh, I'm in business with my role has always been, you know, if I kind of with, with the experience that I've had now, if you were to say to me, you know, kind of sum up what your job is, my job is to make people believe in the things that I believe in. And I can only do that if I genuinely believe um, because it's an integrity-based business, as I was saying before. So, you know, if I come along to you and say, this artist is the greatest thing, as, you know, since sliced bread, then the artist better be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Otherwise, the next time I come along and spin that same story to you, you're going to say, look, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Get out of here. Um, the reason why I'm able to continue to do what I'm doing after 35 years is that I take my integrity seriously. I take the integrity of my artist seriously. And I make sure that whatever it is that I say and do, is something that the music can back up. So with that company, Hypnosis Music, and these four brand new artists that you'll hear in the coming months and, and, and the coming year, the point is, 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 is that I've used my experience to help these artists get to where they want to go and to back their vision. Um, and then the second company, which is Hypnosis Songs, is a 200 million pound fund to buy publishing catalogs with. Um, and on the surface, the opportunity there is uh, an obvious one. You know, we've had 15 years of technological disruption in the music business that allowed people to be able to consume music for free, uh, illegally albeit, but for free. Um, and as a result of that, songs are available at attractive prices. And then at the same time, we have streaming which has now made it much more convenient, once again, for people to consume music legally. And the income that's coming into our business is the strongest it's been in many, many years. And I believe in the, the, the coming six or seven years, you know, if you'd said to me four years ago, you know, what do you think of young people coming into this business? I would encourage them to come into this business because I love music. But from the perspective of, you know, has this business had the best days it's ever seen, it would be very hard to believe three or four years ago that, in fact, our best days are to come. And I'm incredibly envious today of someone who's, you know, 21 years old and wants to be in the music business because I think that they will see the greatest days that the music business has ever seen. And it's all because streaming is making it possible, again, for people to consume music legally once again. And it's also, for the first time ever, bringing the passive consumer into the economic model of music because we suddenly have people that have never paid for music before in their lives that are paying a tenner a month to be able to have access to music via streaming services. And they're not doing it because 
they believe that you know suddenly they've got a conscience and p the people that make music should be getting paid for it, they're doing it for convenience sake. It's like valet parking. It's if I pay the tenor a month, I get the music, I get to control what I hear, when I hear, et cetera. Whatever the motive, it's tremendous for us and you know, for this fund, these assets are going to increase dramatically in value over the, the, the next six or seven years. And then I also have an ulterior motive to doing the fund, which is that at its starting point of 200 million pounds, we end up being about 122nd of the worldwide publishing business. And it gives us the opportunity to instigate some change. But three or four years down the line, when we're at a billion pounds, we're suddenly 18 or 19 percent of the worldwide publishing business, and then we will be able to dictate change when we, uh, you know, sort of align ourselves in thinking with people like our strategic partners, Cobalt, et cetera. And the change that I'm looking for goes back to what I was saying about the songwriter before, which is the songwriter is delivering probably the most important component of music being successful today. You know, if you're Zara Larson and you've got access to hit songs, you're at the top of the charts. If you're Iggy Azalea and you used to have access to hit chart to hit songs, you're but you don't anymore, you're nowhere. But within the economic uh, equation, the songwriter is getting one thirteenth of the economic model. If I use, you know, downloads are the old paradigm, but if I use them, you know, both the download and 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 uh, um, streaming, the songwriter is getting about one thirteenth of the economic model. And that's not fair. It's not fair and equitable. Um, but the reason why that exists is because the major recording companies own the major publishing companies. From a recorded music side of the business, four-fifths of the money is going to recorded music. One-fifth of the money is going to the song and the publishing side of the business. On the recorded music side, of the equation, the labels are making an 85% margin. And, you know, no, actually, that's not correct. They're not making an 85% margin. 85% of the money is going to the label, and about 15% of the money on average is going to the artist. On the publishing side of the business, yes, the writer is able to keep 85% on average and 15% is going to the publisher, but we're only talking about one-fifth of the money. And every time there's room to improve what a songwriter gets or there's room to improve the economic model or the, the, the revenue, those improvements are being shifted to the recorded music side of the business as opposed to being shifted towards the songwriter. And what I'm looking to do with the fund is to build that critical mass where we are 18, 19, 20% of the worldwide publishing business so that you know, if I pretend for a minute that Ellie is the head of you know, MGM or Paramount Pictures and I'm coming along to her and I'm saying, Ellie, listen, I know you've got you know, George Clooney to star in this movie and you've got Reese Witherspoon to star opposite him, but without my script, you don't have a movie. And unless you pay my writers properly, you're not getting the script. You know? No one is doing that in the music business right now. No one is walking into you know, organizations and saying, listen, until the songwriters are paid properly, they're not delivering songs. This happens, you know, the Screenwriters Guild puts Hollywood on notice once every couple of years. It comes to a standstill. Everyone is in a panic. Everyone's wondering whether there will continue to be movies in production, whether there will be movies being released, et cetera. And uh, they make sure that they pay the writers to ensure that they don't disrupt that. No one's doing that on, on, on the music side of things. And no one has disrupted this business by threatening them when it comes to ensuring that the songwriter should get what they're you know, fair, fair and just rewards are. So if I can bring it back to management and sure. uh, bring it back to um, the choosing of the artists and making decisions. So who, how do you choose who you work with? It, you know, you have to be willing to kill for everyone that you work with. You have to be willing to treat them as if they were your children and give them the same sort of uh, access, love and care 
that uh, uh, you would give your children. I had a, a shocking scenario. I won't say who the manager was, but when I was a young manager, there was somebody that I really, really respected. And he was one of the biggest managers in the world at that time. And he ended up in a scenario where amongst his illustrious clients, he was managing Brian Ferry. And I love Brian Ferry. And I walked up to him one day, probably in a situation like this, and, and I, I said, listen, how's it going with Brian Ferry? And he said, I, I, I quit. And I said, why'd you quit? And he said, well, remember that huge storm that we had? So this is Oct around October 1987 when the massive windstorm happened in London that kind of destroyed Kew Gardens and all that stuff. He said, well, a tree fell on Brian's house and he called me up at 2 o'clock in the morning and he asked me what I was going to do about it. And he said, I have no interest in doing anything at 2 o'clock in the morning with a tree on Brian Ferry's house. He said, so I quit. I'm not that sort of manager. I'm, I'm the guy who's going to be there and be doing my best to get that tree off your house because, like I said, <laughs> I, I can't play the guitar. I can't sing the song. The only thing that gives me a seat at the table is by being as useful as I possibly can be. And if that means taking the tree off your house, I'm going to do the best I can to take the tree off your house. But ultimately what I'm getting at is, you know, your belief has got to be such, like, you know, the, the, probably one of the greatest unsung managers um, of, of our business is Rod Smallwood, who is my partner in Sanctuary. And, you know, I'm able to call myself, you know, or was able to call myself Iron Maiden's co-manager, but I was bullshit. You know, Rod was the real deal. Rod was the guy that no matter what it took, did whatever was necessary for Iron Maiden to win. If that meant taking you know, everyone from the record company out and getting them drunk, that's what he would do. If that meant that you know, he had to go to war with everyone to get them to see things from, from the band's perspective, that's what he would do. Um, he never, ever once flinched when it came to what the band believed in. And, uh, Ultimately, I learned an awful lot from those 21 years that, 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 that we spent together. And uh, that belief in the artist very much comes from him. Even though we should all, it, you know, it should be an inherent part of all of us, I saw it in, in action. And so whilst we're talking about that then, what do you think are the key criteria for kind of the decisions that you make? Like, what, what do you think about on a... So say you've got a, a track and you've got an album coming and, uh, you know, what are you thinking about? What decisions are you making at that point? Well, I, I look at everything from a career perspective, right? So no, nothing is ever going to be more important than the career, right? So, you know, you can have a song that doesn't happen or an album that doesn't happen and still have a great career, but you know the so the criteria for, for for me whenever an opportunity comes across the table and it doesn't matter whether the where the opportunity comes from you know for example the record company might present an opportunity i want the record company to present every opportunity that they think is a good opportunity right i want as much coming at me as possible but i'm going to go through that and you know because there are are opportunities that are good for the song but that are not good for the career. There are opportunities that are even good for the album, but that are not good for the career. There are opportunities that have no effect on the song or the album that can actually be really enhancing to the career. And what I'm looking for is, is, is you know, what, to, to, to choose what the opportunities are, or if, I, if they're not there in front of me, to go out and create the opportunities that I think are gonna enhance the artist's career. Um, because ultimately, you know, that's, that's, that's what you're looking for. Totally agree with you. And so if, if we're talking about, um, you know, remuneration for a manager, um, you know, how do you qu quantify your, your value and, and what do you ask for in, in deals? Um, I'm, I suppose, lucky in the sense that I've done this for a long time. I've done it with the greatest artists in the world, so I've proven myself. So in general... Um, I 
am very, very married to what I get um, for remuneration, and it's always 20% of the gross. I always give what I think are the logical things to give. So, you know, I never get paid on recording costs. I never get paid on producers. But, at, at, you know, once you get past those, you know, if it's live, I don't get paid for the production. You know, I, I give allowances for the production. I give allowances for the support act if the support act is being paid out of the, out of the, the headliner's money, et cetera. But beyond that, I get paid on the gross. And I also do something which is quite unusual, but which I encourage each and every one of you to do that want to be managers, which is to insist that you get paid perpetually on the work that you, or the product, if you like, that you participate in. And, and, and that belief comes from a place where, you know, for example, an artist goes into uh, the recording studio tomorrow and I've had this happen a million times with artists where you know, there's one person that they do a one-off song with, and that person's going to get paid a royalty in perpetuity on that one song, even though their interaction with the band might have been one day, it might have been three or four days. I believe that the role that I play and that the role that any great manager plays um, should be treated the same. You know, if, if, if we are, you know, putting out an album tomorrow and you are, or a, new, a song tomorrow, and you are charging me with using my expertise, my time, um, you know, everything that, that, that and, and belief in everything that goes with it, I should get paid the same way that you get paid. Now, I don't get paid as much as, you know, the, as, as big a share of the pie, but I should continue to get that. So um, I don't care so much about the term. You know, if an artist doesn't like working with me two or three years down the line or, or whatever the case might be, I'm not hung up on that. I want people to be happy, and I want, uh, uh, you know, artists to have some, you know, flexibility within reason. But the one thing that I'm not flexible about is not getting paid for the product that I worked on. So if, if I sign you to, you know, a five-year, sorry, a four, a, call it a four-album deal at a record company, I'm not asking you to pay me in perpetuity for all four albums under that deal, but if I make two of those albums with you and I market two of those albums with you and if I put the tours in place and everything else that goes with those albums being successful, I want to get my royalty forever the same way that you get your royalty forever, the same way that the producer gets his royalty forever, the same way that the record company gets paid forever, etc. And as I say, I would encourage all of you that want to be managers to take a similar position. Lawyers don't like it. Lawyers will kick and scream. They, they, it's not that they don't like it because they, think that, because they think that it's wrong. They don't like it because there's not enough of a precedence for it. So it's something that, even with my success and experience, that I have to really fight over. Um, but I don't see why you shouldn't um, get the same. And I'm, I guess you know, my message is it's possible Nothing ventured, nothing gained, so go for it. And, you know, the, the industry's changed so much in the last kind of 20, 30 years. And for young managers in the room or people in the room who are kind of thinking about going into management, um, what, what kind of um, words of advice would you give them? It's great in regards to, to the deal and the value, but what other words of advice would you give them? Um, You need to ensure, if you're going to be a manager, you need to ensure that you don't need your opinion to be validated by somebody else, right? Because that belief that I talked about, you know, the Rod Smallwood belief in Iron Maiden, um, Elliot Roberts' belief in Neil Young, John Landau's belief in Bruce Springsteen, you know, that goes against the grain of everything that's going on in this business because you guys don't want to be doing what's happening right now. You want to be doing what's next, right? The opportunity is in what's next. You know, there's already Frank Ocean today. You don't want to be the next Frank Ocean. You want to be what is next. You want to push the envelope and go further. And that requires tremendous discipline it requires having 
the mental free time to be able to seriously consider what the opportunities are that are in front of you and to be able to visualize and believe in what you want to do with that artist. You need to be incredibly communicative with your artist to the point where you are not relying on what they're telling you, but you're actually relying on their conduct. So you know, one of the most important things that I do with artists is I listen. And I spend a tremendous amount of time listening. And sometimes when I'm spending that tremendous amount of time listening, I'm thinking it would be so easy to just jump in right now and say, stop this nonsense. Here's what we need to do. But if I did that, they wouldn't feel as if they were heard. I wouldn't be hearing what was important to them, because that's a massive part of, of the equation. And then I wouldn't be able to react to that with sound advice um, in a way that was credible and in a way that they would listen to. Um, and as I said, you know, the, the, one of the things that's, that's, that's critical is that you have to look at your artists in the way that they conduct themselves. Because when you're talking to people, people are going to tell you what they think you want to hear, or they're going to tell you um, you know, what they think the record company wants to hear. But their conduct, when they're away from that sort of a discussion, gives you real indications as to what's important to them or not. And our job as managers isn't to do what we want to do. It's to do what they want to do. Our job is to facilitate their vision for themselves and to help them bring it to, to, to fruition. Now, you know, the, the, the artist versus, you know, the old artist versus the new song era means that there are once again more Svengalis in this business. Um, but that's not management. You know, that's just taking advantage of opportunities. I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm interested in being in business with great artists, and that means supporting their vision, not mine. Great. So let's bring it back to the audience. And um, have you got any questions out there? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, am I on? Yeah. Um, Where are you? I'm here. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> um, you talked quite a lot about publishing. Uh, and it was interesting what you were saying about um, delivering the record to a record label and just having them release it, and that's it, just putting in the release schedule. Do you think then the future of artist management is doing as much of that process as possible before giving it to traditional, conventional publishers, record labels? Do you think that's more and more of what management actually is? There, I think we have to recognize that there are tremendous people you know, working, you know, there's, there's a fallacy out there that, you know, record companies aren't any good, publishing companies aren't any good, you know, the internet is there, streaming is there, we can do all of this ourselves, right? And that's bullshit, right? Because we are never, ever, as managers, going to want to have infrastructure that means that we've got a thousand people around the world working for us. It's not economically feasible or possible, right? So you want to be in business with a great record company. You want those people that are in the record company uh, running around the world and getting people excited, whether it's in Amsterdam, whether it's in London, whether it's in New York, or Beijing for that matter. Uh, but before you get to that place, you need to ensure that uh, what you have to sell is the best that it can possibly be, and that you have a very compelling story to tell. Because the one thing that is true about record companies is that they've never been smaller than they are today. The people that are working for them have never been as highly taxed as they are today. Um, and you know, one of the things that, as a, as a manager, you know, I was saying this to Ellie the other day. You know, if you work for a record company and you go to work at at, at nine o'clock tomorrow, you know, on Monday morning, and you work until seven thirty or eight o'clock Monday night, and you've got most of what you needed to get done done, you can go home and you can say, you know what, I put eleven hours in today. It's a good day's work. I've got some good things done, and I'm off. No one can be mad at me, 
right? If you're a manager, you can't go until you've fulfilled your responsibility to the artist. And, and ultimately, um, not to digress away from your question, but it, it strikes me that I haven't said this, management ultimately is about responsibility. Right. You are, are, as I was saying at the very beginning, you know, whether you look at them as your children, whether you look at them as your brother, your sister, your best friend, or whatever, you have a responsibility to that artist to do your very, very best for them and to bring to fruition their vision. Now, you've got to be aligned in that vision. You've got to have that belief that I talked about. But it's a real responsibility. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't urge any of you to take this path unless you are prepared to fulfill that responsibility and, and, and literally to kill for your artists. But going back to, to, to your question specifically, I think the more you can give a record company to work with today, um, you know, first of all, they're not going to sign you unless you've got something to, 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 to work with. So you know the business that I came into, you could walk into a record company with a four song demo and the A&R persons or even the record company presidents or chairman's role was to listen, see if they liked it, and if they were willing to then put the money in to develop that. Obviously, that's not the world that we live in today. If you, if you walk in and you don't have significant social media presence, if you haven't made videos yourself, if you haven't made songs yourself, if you haven't created an attitude that you know, people that care about music are identifying with and, and, and making that clear online, you're not going to get a deal. It doesn't matter how good your records sound. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, how good you look or, or whatever the case might be. You have to do a big chunk of this yourself to get to that place. One more okay, one more question, please. Hello, am I on? Keep going, You're on. Okay. <laughs> um, these days, how do emerging artists and managers find each other? Um, you know, I have, you know, when I was walking up to say hi to Chris, an artist DM'd me on Instagram and said, can I send you my song? And as much as I know that the chances are that very little of it will come out of that, and as much as I know that that's going to put me in the painful position of having to tell somebody that they should go and try and be a doctor or a lawyer instead, <laughs> I still have to say yes, and I still have to take that risk because I don't know whether it's the next Frank Ocean or what comes after Frank Ocean that has just sent me that. And because music means so much to me, I have to take the risk. And, and like I said, it is almost inevitably going to end up in me saying, go and be a doctor or, or a lawyer, because at least then you can have, you know, you can be one of the 75% best doctors or lawyers and still you know, earn a nice sort of standard of, of, of living, whereas to be successful in music, you literally have to be one of the one or two percent. Um, and people don't like you um, uh, crashing their dreams, if you like, or whatever the right cliche is. But I can't take the risk that I'm going to miss out on something that could be the greatest thing that I've ever heard. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks very much for coming.